Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for the Tell Me More series. This program focuses on clinical trials and is facilitated by Dr. Rodolfo Bordoni. For more information on other installments of the Tell Me More series, please visit Cancer Support Community Atlanta's website, cscatlanta.org. Hello, I'm Dr. Rodolfo Bordoni. I'm a medical oncology in the Atlanta community. My affiliation is with Georgia Cancer Specialist and Northside Hospital Cancer Institute. My practice focuses on clinical trials, research in cancer patients. And we're going to talk today about clinical trials in oncology. So I think that the first thing is the definition of clinical trials. There are several definitions. One that I like is that a clinical trial is a research study that evaluates the efficacy against the disease and the safety to the host of new treatment approaches in human beings. And please notice that there are two components and this portion of the definition, efficacy, meaning we want actually the new drug to be effective against the cancer. The second component is safety. We need the drug to be safe. If this drug is very effective against cancer, but is not safe enough for the patient, this drug never will come to the market. Second, the uh, ultimate goal of the clinical trials, when a new treatment is deemed efficacious and is safe, clinical trials compare the experimental agent to the existing standard of care. The standard of care is supposed to be the best treatment based on available evidence to move the science of medicine forward. So the key here is moving science forward. And this is actually the only objective, safe way to move uh, cancer research or in general medicine forward. So why clinical trials are important? I think that this is a very important concept. First of all, clinical trials are today the only objective, methodic, well-organized way to make progress in medicine in general and cancer in particular. Just in the last 20 years, we all witnessed dramatic trends and the progress we are making would have been unthinkable without cancer research. And I'm talking just in 20 years. 20 years is not even a person generation. So we went actually from just learning about clinical trials with chemotherapy to target agents, immunotherapy, and many new treatments that really make a difference, not only in how to treat cancer, living longer, but also living better. So there are a few examples that I would like to present. The first one is improvement in cancer survival. Cancer survival is usually expressed in the proportion of patients that are alive at five years from the beginning of the treatment. Again, in a very few uh, or a small uh, period of time, just 50 years since the 70s, back then only one in two or about 50% of the cancer patients, regardless of the stage, were alive at five years of the diagnosis. So again, and this is important regardless of the stage, some of these patients have early stage disease and maybe surgery was the only thing needed to cure the patient. Nowadays, and this is actually from a publication in 2018, two out of three, or close to 70% of the cancer patients are alive five years from their diagnosis. And one more time, that is independent of the stage. Now, to be more specific, for instance, the five-year survival in a very little disease as melanoma, which is a type of a skin cancer very aggressive, is 40%. This actually, I remember, I started practicing in this country about 35 years ago, and I remember back then, advanced melanoma, patients die in a matter of months. For lung cancer, is 15%. Now, this is all data. The 15% actually is going to change or is changing already with the introduction of immunotherapy and targeted therapy. Now, pediatric cancers are a model in the treatment of cancers in general, and about 80% of children are alive and doing well five years after the beginning of the treatment. And most of these patients, remember, unfortunately, have advanced disease at the time of the diagnosis. There is another way to 
consider or measure the improvement in uh, cancer research or cancer uh, evaluation and studies. Example two actually is improvement in cancer death. The cancer death rate decreased close to 20%. And this is just in 25 years, or in other words, since the early or mid 1990s. Remember, every 100 patients with cancer advance 20% live, you know, two, three, five years that would have succumbed to the disease in the 1990s. Now, example number three is different. It's not about efficacy. This is another goal of clinical trial and it's improvement in the quality of life. I told you before, we want better drugs to work better on the cancer, but also we want drugs that work better on the host, on the patients. And these days, individuals with cancer live active, fulfilling life with fewer side effects than just less than two decades ago. One more time, immunotherapy, target therapy are better tolerated treatments and patients have better quality of life. Now, why to participate in clinical trials? And another actually reason, other than the ones that I mentioned before, is because clinical trials are safe. But are safe meaning not side effects of the uh, new drugs or experimental agents, safe for the patient. And the reason is because of the many regulations uh, that now exist international and nationally. And one of them is the World Medical Association that is an inter internationally dependent confederation of free professional medical associates that represent physicians around the world. This association was established just a few years ago in September 1947 uh, and has grown actually to 115 national medical associations in 2021 or 1467 associate members. Now, this is an important association because this association actually looks for the safety and the consideration of the well-being of the patients or the subjects participating in clinical trials. The World Medical Association developed what is well, well known as Declaration of Helsinki. The declaration is a statement of ethical principles for medical research involving human beings, including research on identifiable human material and data. Again, ethical principles are the basis of this association. The primary purpose of this medical uh, this, uh, association of medical research involving human subjects is to understand the cause of the disease, but even more important to improve the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of them based on principles of safety and quality. Again, safety and quality. Medical research is subject to ethical standards that promote and ensure respect for all human subjects and protect their health and rights. I'm pretty sure actually uh, you are very aware the first half of the 1900s was a time actually that some of these ethical standards didn't exist. And because of that, and mainly reverberates in the um, minorities in this country and around the world, some injustices that were part of clinical trials that is not possible these days because of this new in place ethical standard in the country and international. While the primary purpose of medical research is to generate uh, new knowledge, the goal can never take precedent over the rights and interests of individual research subjects. Again, first of all, is the safety of the subject. Second, is the efficacy and the knowledge. It is the duty of the physician who are involved in medical research to protect the life, the health, dignity, integrity, right to self-determination, privacy, and confidentiality of the personal information of research subject. And this is very important. Many people actually come to the office. We introduce them to clinical trials and they are skeptical because they believe that the data is going to be shared around the world with other people and the name and personal information is going to be disclosed and that is not the case. And by the way, physicians are the subject of ethical, legal and regulatory norms in their countries and internationally. So there are standards around the world 
And this actually cannot happen. The integrity, the dignity, the health, etc., cetera, uh, the self-determination is absolutely protected when the patients decide to participate in a clinical trial. Now, I'm going to conclude by talking about a very important topic, minorities participation in clinical trials. And I'm going to start by giving you an example. This is immunotherapy. You may know for the past 15 years, many patients have been treated, thousands around the world, maybe by now millions with immunotherapy. There is a new treatment modality for patients, mainly with advanced cancer of different kinds. So immunotherapy is a new successful treatment modality for cancer. Fewer than 4% of the people who took part in the clinical trials that led to the approval of immunotherapies to treat lung cancer were African Americans, less than 4%. However, fortunately, this is changing. This is a paper from Cancer, which is a journal, very prestigious, that it was published in December 2021. The title actually of the paper was Black and Hispanic Populations Remain Underrepresented in Clinical Trials. However, participation has increased. So just to give you some idea, the final cohort that was a study for this paper were more than 242,000 patients. Of them, close to 200,000 patients were non-Hispanic white. However, more than 20%, I mean, 20,000 patients were black, more than 10,000 were Hispanic, close to 7,000 were Asian, and American, Indian, and Native were about 9,000. And you may, may think actually that these numbers are pretty dismal. However, the um, 20,000 and the 10,000 male in Black and Hispanic is a significant improvement compared with before, maybe in the last 20 or 25 years. Now, participation has increased in particular in cancers like breast, colorectal, lung, and prostate cancer. Just to give you an example, these are the odds of Black patients participating between 2015 and 2019. So we are just talking five years. The improvement has been statistically significant. So in breast cancer, for instance, the participation more than doubled. In lung cancer improved by more than 50%. In prostate cancer by about 15%. And all this difference, one more time in about five years, is statistically significant. For Hispanics, that now is the first minority in this country between the same period of time for breast cancer, improved by three times. For colorectal cancer, more than two times. For lung cancer, almost four times. And for prostate cancer, about 70%. And one more time, this difference in just five years is statistically very significant. Now, in the last decade or more, uh, many organizations, the FDA in our country, and some of the cooperative clinical trial groups in the country have focused on enhancing diversity participation in clinical trials. An example is older patients. You may say, well, older patients are not a major minority, and you are absolutely right. Actually, cancer is a disease of older patients. However, until recently, 25, 30 years ago, or even less. Some older patients were uh, banned for participation in clinical trials. And the definition was 60 or 65 years old or above. In 2020, for instance, the FDA issued a draft guidance recommendation for increasing the number of older patients defined as 65 or above enrolled onto cancer treatment trials. And the reason is because if we generate data from clinical trials with patients in the 40s or 50s, we don't know if that can be extrapolated to patients that are older with different tolerance to treatments, with different comorbid conditions, etc. Historically, one more time, patients age 65 and older have been significantly underrepresented in and sometimes explicitly excluded from adult cancer clinical trials. This is a clinical trial part of a cooperative clinical trials group in the country. It's called SWOT, and that actually stands for Southwest Oncology Group. 
This is a clinical trial in particular called SWOP 1918, activated last spring and led by a physician, Dr. Elizabeth Brem. It's the first NCTN clinical trial in lymphoma, which is a liquid tumor, exclusively enrolling patients 75 years old and older. Now, I don't know, this may be actually the first NCTN clinical trial. However, we have been participating, I'm talking about Northside uh, Hospital and Cancer Institute and Georgia Cancer Specialist for the past six or seven years in a clinical trial yeah, about a lymphoma that is called Hodgkin lymphoma in patients that are elderly, only patients 65, I'm sorry, 60 or above. So there has been now for many years clinical trials that are focused on patients that are defined as elderly. The distinct treatment needs of older patients were the focus of two major SWOC presentations at our ASH annual ASH meeting, which is the American Society of Hematology in December 2021. What this means is what I just mentioned before. Elderly patients have comorbid conditions that are not present in younger patients. They have different tolerance to different medications, and that is because the organ function of elderly patients is different, is to some extent deficient compared with younger patients. While this community, the elderly, is centrally an underrepresented group in cancer research, it is by no means a minority group among patients with cancer, which means it's incumbent on all of us in SWOT. These actually are words by one of the chairs of this organization who to be their advocates. Again, one more time, as I told you, the majority of patients with cancer when they are diagnosed are also 60, 65 or, um, or older, which means actually they are elderly. Another example is in the University of Alabama, they developed this cancer and aging resilience evaluation. This is an evaluation to customize, to personalize the treatment of cancer to each patient 65 or above, recognizing the different challenges and limits often associated with a particular patient at their age. Finally, so one more time, this cooperative group has a number of concepts in development that focus on identifying the best treatment regimen for patients who are older and or frail. And frail actually, the definition is because of the comorbid conditions, one more time, or because of the organ function, and thus not good candidates for a standard, more intensive treatment. Some clinical trials use different schemes, different doses of the same experimental drug when um, applies to patients 60 or 65. I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to leave also my name and also be my affiliation, Georgia Cancer, Northside Hospital and the telephone number of my office. So if you have any question, any comment, or if you want to make a consultation, I will be more than happy to discuss with you clinical trials that apply to cancer patients. Thank you. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.